Welcome back, everyone. We are now into the percussion portion of the day, and it's uh, great to have Matt Moore with us. Welcome, Matt. And uh, Matt is from the Toronto area, grew up in Scarborough, Scarborough Citadel, and uh, went to university at uh, Toronto and then in Cleveland, uh, and has played with some orchestras, the Toronto Symphony, to name a few. Um, and uh, I actually went to school with Matt uh, at U of T and always saw him in the practice room while I was uh, you know, going to Tim Hortons or something. So uh, he's, he's a very talented musician. And uh, Matt's going to walk us through uh, some amazing stuff on his uh, percussion, you know, on the kit, on the snare drum, some uh, d essentials. And then he's going to do uh, some mallet stuff as well. But uh, it's great to have you, Matt. And I'm going to just turn it over to you after I say that if you're watching us live, make sure you put in some questions and comments uh, that we can get to at the end. And if you're watching this after, then Feel free to comment anyway, but we're not going to respond to it. So with that being said, welcome, Matt, and take it away. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be a part of this year's Micro Music Camp, and you can see my cat's tail going through the video. Um, so a couple things I want to cover in today's Percussion Masterclass, and we're going to start with the most minute details of percussion and try and get a big picture by the end of the session. So first, I want to talk about how, as drummers, we have to use implements to strike our instrument, whereas brass players, in contrast, get to touch the instrument physically. So they have their mouthpiece or they can use their hands and fingers, there's my cat, to uh, play their instruments with the valves or the slide. So it's very important for us to have a good connection to the stick that is doing the playing for us, essentially. We're just controlling it. Um, so something I like to do, and everyone can do this, whether you have sticks or not, is just to find my arms first. So if everyone could put both arms out, I'll just do one to show you what muscles I'm talking about at the time. So put your arms straight out and, and feel the muscles that you're using to hold it up. And then first, let go of the muscles that are holding your hand up, so from your wrist. And it should kind of flop like that, just like that. And then let go of the muscles that are holding your forearm. and you're still holding up the rest of your arm from your shoulder and now let go of that. And this should make your arm feel very heavy and, and you should have a lot of weight there and you can feel it on both arms. And then if you were to just flop it on a practice pad, like I have here, I'll move back a bit so you can see that on a practice pad. And that'll give you a lot of weight, a lot of natural fullness to your sound. And that's the most comfortable and relaxed way that we can play the drums. So how do we, make that transition then to the tip of the stick. That's through our fulcrum, which is where we hold the stick in our hands. It's our fingertips and, and how we manipulate the stick. So in order to find a relaxed and a natural fulcrum, we should first lift our wrist, our hand from our wrist up with the stick following and let go of the wrist, letting the stick drop to the pad and let the stick rebound up without the hand following and catch the stick with your fingers, whichever finger feels most natural, like that. And again, just like that. And for me, I catch it kind of in the middle finger and a bit of the index at the back there and primarily the thumb. Everyone's thumb is gonna be active for this. That's how we hold things. Um, and that's how we connect to the stick and that's how we can use our weight of our arm that we just found to play the drums. So here we can use that fulcrum to then keep bouncing the stick, just like a basketball. And that is our first basic stroke. It's a full stroke. We start at the top, go all the way down and come right back up to where we started. The next stroke is a transition to a tap, which is a down stroke. So we start at the top, and we finish at a lower height than we started. These are the first two basic strokes, full and down. And down gets us right into position for a tap stroke, which is just a lower version of the full stroke. It's a softer dynamic, if you're familiar with dynamics. And we can transition through crescendos and diminuendos between full strokes and tap strokes. 
And finally, from the top position, you have the upstroke, which starts at a low height and ends higher. So what's the point of these strokes? Well, they make up basically all of drumming. Um, I know not that exciting. I know drums can usually cause a lot of excitement in people and it's such a cool instrument, but it really boils down to those four things. And they make up all the rudiments that we know. And the first thing to know are these three basic rudiments. So you have the single stroke roll, which is right, left, right, left. And that makes up almost all of drumming. And then the second basic rudiment that I want to talk about is the double stroke roll, where you are then also manipulating the rebound after the first initial stroke. So you have the second stroke just bounces, but we have to support that from our fulcrum using the weight that we found at the beginning of the video. And that goes right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. And the important thing about this is that through the double stroke roll, once we get it fast enough, we can actually transition to a multiple bounce roll or a buzz roll, which is how we sustain a drum, which is used in almost all snare drum repertoire in Salvation Army and beyond. So we have the double stroke roll. And as it speeds up, you can see I'm using the weight of my arms. And as we get to this tempo, I can create a multiple bounce roll by adjusting my fulcrum. And that's how we sustain the drum. The third basic rudiment and the final rudiment I want to talk about today is the paradiddle, which does a lot of the different stroke types. So first we have our downstroke, upstroke, oh, upstroke, tap, tap, down, up, tap, tap. So right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And as you can see, that then starts to become more musical. We are not just playing one solid dynamic. We have accents. We have different stickings. It's not continuous. We have two different patterns happening, one after the other and repeating. So that kind of opens up the world of possibilities for stroke types and combinations and how we can use these to create better music. So how do we practice this? How do we use this information to become better at percussion, at drums, at being a better musician? Um, so all of these fundamentals are important to know, but they mean nothing if they don't improve your music making. Um, I like to tell a story of before I had any drums or anything like this, and I would come home and I would borrow a pair of sticks like these, just drum set sticks from the core, Scarborough Citadel. And I would come home and turn on the radio and I would sit on my bottom bunk and drum on the, the ladder, just along to whatever came on the radio for hours at a time. I'm sure I annoyed my parents a lot, but that really helped me grow as a musician, as a drummer to learn how to listen to music and interact with it and respond and try and like react in real time to what was happening in songs that I was not so familiar with. And it helped me learn a technique that was just being flexible, depend like regardless of what the music is doing at the time. So that is extremely valuable for anyone who's interested in just getting better as a musician on the drums. But if you have a specific technique that you're interested in improving on the drums. I have a couple things I want to bring to your attention on that too, so that you can um, have some strategies for when it comes to working on those things that you're having trouble with. So first of all, I have my metronome. Everyone should have a good metronome or access to a, any sort of metronome app or hardware. Um, so I'm gonna just turn it on to 75. Oh, this is the quarter note. And I can practice my single strokes. Pretty good. I feel good about that today. So let's, let's mix it up a bit. Maybe I want to be able to play them at 85 and I'm not there yet. So I'm going to change it up, make myself uncomfortable at 75. So that 85 is a little easier. So this is going to be the offbeat now. Two, three, four. Okay. Still too easy. So 
that's the offbeat 16th notes. Okay. Let's add some dynamics. So as you can see, I'm just trying to do things that will kind of throw me off at the easier tempo so that when I want to move it up, I have a great foundation that I can draw from so that it's not quite as challenging. And these are some of the things that you can be working on and experiment with in the practice room on your own time so that when it comes to playing music, you can really be musical with the rudiments or with any repertoire that you're learning. And I'm not sure if all of you were here for the opening session when I had a video play of me playing snare drum, but I was playing a solo by Joe Tompkins, who's a great drummer in the States, and he wrote a lot of French American rudimental solos. And I played one of his solos, which beautifully demonstrates how the rudiments can be used in an extremely musical way, a little bit out of context, but still very beautiful and very groovy, as you, I hope you'll hear. So if we could play that video again, just to demonstrate once again. And I'm going to move over to that one. give you a bit of an idea of how these rudiments can be then extracted from their original form and manipulated to be extremely musical and you can really use them to do anything you want. Um, next I want to talk about xylophone which is an instrument very dear to me. I love playing the xylophone and any keyboard instrument. I started on piano when I was just seven years old and I didn't really like that but xylophone is a lot more fun than that I can promise you. Um, so something that's really important about xylophone, especially if you're playing in a brass band, um, is to practice your scales because so much of the time you are playing what the cornets are playing or what the trombones or euphoniums are playing. And we need to have just as much facility on this instrument as any of they have on their instruments. So a good starting point is to do scales chromatically um, once a day, 10 times each scale and just move up the instrument. So even if you have a glockenspiel, this is a possible thing to do. Um, start on an A natural, and I'm just gonna do the scales once each, but I recommend 10 times each a day, and work your way up. I'll give you a short demonstration. We're gonna stick with 75 beats per minute. Oh, I'm gonna cut that in half. So while I'm doing that, and well, I hope that you choose to practice this, really pay attention to how fluidly you can move up and down the instrument. It should feel exactly the same as on the practice pad, but just with some lateral motion and motion this way, up and off, like on the accidentals, off the accidentals, up and down the scales. It's not that complicated. It's not, it shouldn't be scary. And you could practice it this slowly and you will see improvements in one week. I promise you. Just don't do this anymore. Like, we don't need to do this. That's 
very even at that tempo, but if you had to play something with the cornets, I'm assuming it's gonna be faster than that. So it'd be good to be comfortable doing the scales with both hands so that you can create a more fluid motion, a more fluid sound, more legato sound, and kind of match the cornets or whatever other brass instrument you're playing with a lot more. Okay, now let's transition over to the drum set. I have a con, so talented. Oh, thank you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> um, the drum set is really an instrument that is accompanying. I know as drummers, this is an instrument that everyone loves to play. It's just such a like, like it brings back your caveman like desires to just hit things. Um, but regardless of how fun this is, we have to remember that the drum set is usually not a solo instrument. We are accompanying everyone else and we can play with people instead of just feeling like we're less than them, we can be at an equal level, but we need to really listen as much as we are paying attention to ourselves. So I like to break this down into two different categories. Um, first is preparatory listening, and second is active listening. So whenever I approach something on the drum set, I like to do the preparatory listening, which is listening to the songs that I'm going to be playing or in as many versions of those songs as possible um, before I have to perform them. So for example, if I know I'm gonna be playing like a song this Sunday, I'll try and find as many songs and I'll do like as many versions of that song and I will really listen to what the drummer is doing in each verse. Does it change between verses? What do they do to get from the verse to the chorus? Like what kind of groove and style are they aiming for? It all comes back and boils back down to playing along to the radio, getting to know a lot of different kinds of music and just becoming interested and invested in the information of drumming and, and the different styles and different characters that we can be. So once you've done that preparatory listening, you can then go to your rehearsal or your performance or Sunday service. And when you are performing or playing, you have to do active listening as an accompanist. So that involves listening to the rest of the ensemble, being aware of what the cornets are doing, what the piano is doing, what the guitars are doing, and, and what does that mean to you? Also, when you show up to the first rehearsal and you have listened to a bunch of different versions of My Redeemer Lives, but then you find out that the version you're doing is completely different, you need to be able to react on the spot and understand that just because we don't have any information on our music, like any written music, we need to be responsible for coming up with a groove that will work with that song, with that version of that song. So an example of this is My Redeemer Lives, which we played a lot at Scarborough Citadel during Easter time. Um, and there's an a awesome funk version that we would always do. And the, the trumpets had this great part at the beginning, all the brass trumpets and trombones. And I, I just thought that was the coolest thing because I'd never heard that in this context before. So I knew I had to bring that out right in the opening. So I chose to do something like this. So as you can see, that's, that's really basic and it might be like, oh yeah, of course he would do that. But that's only because I listened that I knew to do that. So it all boils down again to the two different kinds of listening. I could have listened to any kind of My Redeemer Lives, but I wouldn't have come up with that without doing the active listening as well. So next I want to talk about knowing what groove to play. And for those of you who haven't played drum set before, Maybe you're interested, maybe you're not interested, maybe you've seen drummers and you're like, well, that looks kind of cool, but I don't understand anything they're doing. I just want to give you a quick breakdown of the most basic, um, the most basic drum set beat, which is a rock beat, one and three on the kick drum, two and four on the snare drum. This is a great launching off point to then come to the rehearsal with this and listen to the band 
and see what you could add from the band's arrangement into this groove. So just to give you an idea of where we could start. So one, two, three, four. So you'll notice, sorry, I know it might be loud. You'll notice that nothing is tense, nothing is army. It's very light, very easy. I, I hardly have to move because this is such a um, constant motion pattern. So I think with that, you can then listen. Maybe there's like, doom, boom, doom, boom. So. Maybe the horns are doing that. So you want to bring that out because you find that really cool. Um, so that's something that will kind of get you started with this active listening concept. Just have an idea of something you can play and then listen while you're playing that and try and incorporate the things that you hear and that you find interesting. Um, finally, I want to talk about fills on drum set in the context of the music. And that's the most important thing. I think fills should always be considered in the context that they are being presented in. So for example, let's say we're playing a ballad, which is like really heavy. It, it's like everyone's super hallelujah, you know? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to then go it, it just doesn't fit in the context of the music because it's too fast, it's too like busy and it, it has too much drive. So with that heavy groove, we need to have a heavy fill. And on top of that, let's say we have our heavy groove, which is maybe this is our chorus on the ride cymbal. So we're about like this level of grooving. And then we're gonna transition to like a quiet verse. So we need to have a, a uh, fill that gives us that transition so that the band can then fit in to the next verse. That is how we can be the best accompanists in that moment. So an example of that, and it doesn't have to be complicated, it's just this. So Really, it all boils down to being aware and listening and, and being a smart thinker on the, on the spot of how can I bring the band into the next section of the piece? Because that's what a fill is. It's filling the time between sections. Um, and an alternative version is, let's say we're playing an up-tempo song and the fill should drive the band into the chorus. So I'll start on the hi-hat and we're like, like that so you can see that that was like you know so it had more notes it crescendoed a little bit and it also drove right to the end with the ride cymbal so those are the small things to think about that make a huge difference when playing drum set and finally i just have a couple closing remarks i don't know if we have any questions or anything that I could go over again. If there are any drummers out there, that'd be great to hear from them. Yeah, I've I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, if awesome. do you have a few more remarks you want to make, or do you want to jump right into? Questions? I can make them at the end. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's awesome to just sit back and listen to. Um, so you're talking a lot about listening and yes. um, being engaged in the music, but as we know, uh, sometimes as a Salvation Army drummer in a worship team or a band setting. Uh, you also need to drive it because maybe the band will drag a bit. So yeah. do you want to explain your mindset when you start to notice that kind of thing? Yeah, okay, that's like a very big topic. Um, so a lot of that is a push and pull thing. You don't want to run away from the ensemble because then you're not being a great musician. You are not really accompanying. You can provide rhythmic information by just being a little bit ahead of the beat. And that little bit will pick up after a while if the band follows you. If the band doesn't follow you, then I think that game is kind of lost a little bit in that scenario. Hopefully we'll work on that in rehearsal a little bit, but yeah. just little pushes at a time. And I think 
will make a big difference. Yeah, and um, so obviously as kids, you might be more drawn to you know playing the kit, like you were saying. That's yeah. the that's the most fun instrument people Definitely. would sometimes say. Um, so how do you balance as a teacher, for example? How would you balance you know letting the kid try the drum set, but then also uh, telling them you know well th this is why you need to practice your rudiments because it you know leads into that. What what's your I, approach on that kind of topic? I like to introduce kids, especially if they're mostly interested in drum set. Um, I like to let them play drum set because that's what I did as a kid. I played only drum set for the first like four years that I was playing percussion. And I got to experiment and learn how to play with music and I found that that really informed me on what the drummer's role is in the music. And then when I hit roadblocks of, oh wait, I can't do that, I would then come and consult someone who was more advanced at the drums and they would be like, well, you haven't practiced any rudiments. And I'd be like, oh. That's why. <laughs> That's <laughs> and if so, they're invested enough in the drum set, they'll be inspired to then practice the rudiments. Or at least right. I was. Yeah, and it's it's like the same thing for brass instruments. You know, why do we practice our scales and that kind yeah. of thing? Um, because it transitions so well to faster notes, and so the yeah. same thing with uh, sticking. And even when you were at the mallets, you know, showing yeah. at that slow tempo using the. Uh, the two hands at a slow tempo is very critical. When would you yeah. say it like clicked for you uh, from a musical and a technical standpoint? Um, I think I got it musically before I got it technically. Um, and I think that might be because I started on brass and piano um, from a younger age. But then probably somewhere in, in high school, I, I started to be like, oh, this is actually going to be kind of cool if I keep doing this a lot and, and practice a lot, then I could actually be good at this. And it's something I'm interested in doing. So that, that's really when I started pursuing it more right. full time. And so obviously, like Salvation Army drummers, um, they used to be just a snare drum, bass drum, yeah. cymbal kind of thing. Um, and it's evolved a lot, especially with staff yes. bands and worship teams. and. You know, you look at a guy like Jacob Sluis, who's immersed in that jazz uh, percussion, but you yeah. yourself are doing lots of orchestral work. So what would you say is your favorite type of music making, um, you know, from a percussion standpoint? Oh, um, honestly, as a percussionist, the best thing that, the thing that I enjoy the most is music where I feel like the ensemble is all just listening and regardless of the size, because you can do it like the Toronto Symphony does that. Like a hundred people on stage, everyone's listening to each other and, and communicating musically to each other, or you can do it just as a duet. Whenever you have two people in the same space or more and they're communicating musically, that's just the best experience you can have as a musician. Yeah, and so for you, how do you avoid boredom in the practice room, or how did you avoid it um, as a younger kid? As a younger kid, I, I played a lot to music. Um, it, it was a lot of listening to the radio and, and learning about, not like academically learning about music, but just learning, like listening to music that I didn't know about before and, and finding that interesting that people would choose to pre present that as their music of choice. and and how they developed that themselves and what was interesting about that kind of music. Right. Okay, that's all the questions I have. So uh, okay. you want to make your closing remarks and then I have one or two more things just to say. Awesome. Yeah, so the only things that I've left um, are listen to as much music as you can and as many different kinds as you can because really, at least for me, that is 100% of where it's all rooted from. And yes, as we said before, practice technique is important, but it's a means to an end of being a great musician and realizing who you are as a human and how you can communicate that as a musician. And the last thing, which I think is always important in the drum master class, is to enjoy playing the drums. They are the coolest instrument, regardless of what anyone else says. <laughs> so. Excellent. Nice. Well, thanks All so right. much, Matt. It's wonderful, and uh, I know I've uh, really enjoyed, um, you know, seeing you develop as a musician uh, through Salvation Army and then seeing it professionally as well. It's awesome and always, you know, glorifying God through your music making, which is great. If you're a drummer at home, there is material for you to practice. 
Uh, it's the percussion course by the Music and Gospel Arts Department, THQ, Canada Bermuda Territory. Uh, so download that for free on our website um, and start practicing. And then I'm sure there's lots of, uh, you know, videos out there that you can watch of uh, people doing rudiments and all that kind of stuff. So check that out. The link uh, will be displayed um, with the background. And uh, yeah, keep practicing and just go with God, you know. So thanks so much, Matt, and uh, we'll, awesome, yeah. we'll talk to you later. Next up is uh, the closing session with Phil and Sarah, and uh, I think the Dunstans as well will make an appearance. So thanks for watching, and stay tuned for the next one. <laughs>